beautiful here. so well and I you know I personally will never forget that uh, image of the shards when I think about people leaving their homelands it's really really beautiful um, you talk about um, the in, to go to how to stay sane in an age of division um, you talk about how when we when we constantly consume the kind of books that share only our visions or read articles that only agree with our views and our values that's a profoundly narcissistic existence, right? Um, how does one break out of that in an age of social media algorithms showing you exactly what they think you should see or want to see? And, you know, when governments sort of maybe have, have a lot more control over are going towards a more nationalistic um, approach, how, how does, how do people come out of that and, and uh, explore the other? Indeed, and I think this is why we all, as citizens of the world, as citizens of humanity, we need to be more engaged, more aware, um, in the sense that we need to ask ourselves, are all my friends thinking like me, you know? If we are surrounded with people who all think alike, dress up in the same way, maybe vote in the same way, express themselves in the same way, that's an echo chamber and we don't learn from echoes. If we're only reading the same type of newspapers or the same type of books or following the same type of YouTube videos, if all our source of information comes from the same places, again, that's an echo chamber. And I think we need to be careful about that because we as humans do not learn from repetitions. We do not learn from sameness as much as we learn from differences when people from different backgrounds with different stories come together they challenge each other and they help each other to, to have cognitive flexibility shifting perspectives i am a big believer in the importance of cosmopolitan encounters in the importance of bringing people from different stories together and let them talk to each other again coming from a country like turkey I think by losing that cosmopolitan heritage and never respecting it, we lost a lot. And I'm not talking about a financial loss or political loss. Also, it, almost in your psychology, you lose something deep. So we need to defend diversity. That doesn't mean diversity is easy, but to be open to learn, not to be that sure of our own truths, not to put the last full stop and at least you know, to be open. I like intellectual exchanges. For me, a proper intellectual exchange means I have my opinions. I have been thinking about them, I've been reading about them, but I'm here to listen to you. And if what you say makes sense to me, I'm also ready to change my opinion. So you don't close the door, you leave the door agile, you know? And that is something that we have lost to a large extent, mostly because of social media this polarization, extreme bitterness in our political narratives. But I believe as citizens of humanity, we need to be very careful about this. Um, you talk about the pandemic not just being a public health crisis or an ec economic recession or a political uh, incompetence. You talk about it being a crisis of meaning. Um, talk to us a little bit about that. I think until almost recently, uh, quite recently, there was this arrogant view of the world that divided the entire globe into almost two camps, into solid countries and liquid countries. Maybe I should start with an example. Um, I, I never forget this scholar with all the good intentions who came to Istanbul to study. She was, she was writing a paper on women writers from the Middle East. 
And at some point in passing, she said to me, she's an American scholar, that it was very understandable for me, a feminist, for me to be a feminist, because I was living in Turkey after, after all. Mm -hmm. And I, it stayed with me, what she said there between lines, as if you need to worry about women's rights or human rights or freedom of speech or democracy in some parts of the world, but not really quite so much in America or in Europe or in the developed Western world. But what happened after 2016 is that that dualistic way of seeing the world has been shattered to pieces. And now more and more people realize that there's no such thing as solid lands versus liquid lands. And in fact, we're all living in liquid times, which means it can happen in America, as we have seen, it can happen in Europe, it can happen anywhere. And we all need to think about women's rights. We all need to think about democracy. We all need to think about what kind of a future do we want, not only for ourselves, but for the coming generations. That already was the political atmosphere, but on top of that, when the pandemic came, I think it forced us to ask some even more meaningful questions with regards to our main values. You know, what is happiness? Is it making more money? Is it making more profit? What should be our aim in life? Or, or is happiness really having the freedom to walk in the park and sit under a tree? Because with the pandemic, suddenly you realize you can't do these things that you take for granted. And I think it shifted people's perspectives. But it also helped us to question things like, what is democracy? Um, do we want what kind of, you know, uh, as I said, a life we, we want to live together? Um, we also need to understand that the pandemic was hailed, not hailed, of course, but it was called as a great equalizer mm -hmm. in the sense that here in the UK and elsewhere, we have been told that because pandemic recognized no distinction, no differences, we were all in this boat together. You know, whether you're, whatever your skin color, whatever your gender, whether you're rich or poor, we're all in this together. It's a great equalizer. But in reality, it didn't work out that way. So for instance, in London, if you happen to live in a poorer neighborhood, your chances of getting the virus and dying of the virus are almost three times higher than someone living in a wealthier neighborhood. Or if you happen to be an immigrant, you know, brown communities, black communities, refugee communities have been affected from the pandemic in a much, much more worse way than uh, people who were more privileged. So all these inequalities were also became very visible with the pandemic, which forces us to rethink about our societies, about, about coexistence, peace. So the reason why I'm saying it's a crisis of meanings is we have to redefine our concepts and values. Absolutely. Um, Elif, I can talk to you all day, but I don't want to be selfish and keep you to myself. I'm going to open up to audience questions. I just have one last question from me. Who are your five? Oh, beautiful question. Um, I, I mean, there are, there are friends who mean so much to me, who are very close to my heart. But among my five are also books. I hope this is not a very strange answer. Maybe because I was a single child, you know, raised by a single mom, I had a very lonely upbringing. Books really, really became my friends from an early age onwards. So I have very dear friends. I, I'm a big believer also, as I said, in sisterhood. But within my five, I would also definitely mention books. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Um, if anybody would like to ask questions, can I please ask you to walk over to the microphone uh, at the center of the room and mm -hmm. queue up uh, at a distance? Mm -hmm. And please mm -hmm. keep your mics on uh, while asking your question. Mm -hmm. Yes, please. Mm -hmm. Um, the microphone is in the back. Oh. Hello? Uh, it's Sofia Kashi from Pakistan. I want to, uh, you were mentioning that people mostly feel isolated in their society, in their country. And it is visible in your first book, uh, Leila book, and in the new book you are talking about. Uh, did you ever feel like that in Turkey because you are writing too bold and it seems that it's difficult for the country to digest all of that? Thank you. 
Thank you, Thank you so much. Uh, I, I really appreciate your question, and you, and you put it so beautifully. Did I experience myself similar feelings? Of course, um, and lots of reasons. You know, when I look at my, my own journeys, there were many times for different reasons I felt like the other myself. Uh, and I felt like I didn't quite fit in, or this sense of loneliness, it came with me. Um, and, and maybe you feel a bit like an insider-outsider in the sense that emotionally close enough to love the people, understand the culture, but also enough of an outsider to keep a little bit of a cognitive distance. And I think that cognitive distance is important. It's like you want to talk about a painting, you take a step back. You want to talk about your homeland, you take just a step back, but not too far away. So that a little bit distance is sometimes important for to, to enable us to see things. Also, perhaps writing in English, we didn't get a chance to talk about this. I write in both English and Turkish. Sometimes you don't need to physically travel, but traveling within languages, commuting between languages, also helped me to think about my own culture more closely. You know, I started thinking about words that can't be translated from one language to another very easily. And that pushes you to think more carefully about cultures. You know, why is it like that? Why can't I find the exact um, translation for that word in another language? So I, I'm someone who also very much believes in, in the commutes between, between languages. Um, that was a little bit misunderstood in Turkey when I started writing in English first, some people reacted to me and they said she can't be called a Turkish writer anymore. Uh, but th that's not how my mind works. I think we can dream in more than one language. We can write fiction in more than one language. And sometimes I'm always amazed to observe women who express their anger in one language. <laughs> Immigrants, you know, who choose to express their love in another language. I, I, I pay attention to such details. Uh, every language gives us another zone of existence. I'm not saying it's easy. I think as immigrants, we're very much aware of the gap between our minds and our tongues. You know, we always want to be able to say more and we end up saying less. That gap is very frustrating, but it also pushes us and, and encourages us to think harder, work harder. So that commute is also another space where I can express my moments. Yes, please. Hi, uh, my name is Akhtar Ahmed Kalawi from the Rui newspaper. I really loved uh, uh, the story you mentioned about the earthquake in 1999, how people for once, in, even for a few seconds, felt inclu inclusive um, as one, uh, but then as soon as uh, the situation got better, everything got back to normal. What do you think is an ideal uh, role or something that you would advise individuals on the one that they can do for us to get to that mentality where everyone is included? Because there are things not within people's grasp at the moment as individuals. What do you think is an ideal start for individuals to get to that process? Thank you. Thank you so much. Such a beautiful question. Um, I think this is precisely why we need stories. Because when I learn someone's story, it's much more difficult for me to make generalizations about that person's religion, race, uh, ethnicity, or nationality. If I don't know, then it's easier. Also, I think we need to be careful about numbness. The numbness is something that worries me a lot. I write about it a little bit in this booklet in, in How to Stay Sane. Um, if there's one emotion that, that scares me, that is the lack of all emotions. It's indifference, it's apathy, it's numbness. I am very interested in the memoirs of survivors, of you know, people who have gone through the darkest chapters in human history. They always warn us about indifference. If we stop caring about each other's stories, if we stop caring about each other's pain, um, and if we regard people as only numbers, then there comes the threshold when it makes no difference whether it's 5,000 refugees who have lost their lives or 500,000, whether it's 
this number of people who died in one part of the world or that number of people. Numbers do not stay with us. We do not register. We do not feel them. It's only when I know people's stories as individuals, then I realize the people who I regard as my other are not my other at all. You know, they're my brother. They're my sister. I am the other too. So then all those categories start to dissolve. But for that to happen, I think we need stories and we need multiple stories so that it becomes more difficult to generalize people into easy categories. Wonderful. Yes, please. Uh, my question is uh, related to your novel, 40 Rules of Love. In 40 Rules of Love, you have uh, chosen voiced bilabial for your various chapters. By choosing the voiced bilabial B, you have let go all the unvoiced consonants to start your novel. Of course, you said in the beginning, it's a spiritual reason uh, why you chose B as the, each of your chapters to start. By doing that, have you limited yourself by not using voiceless consonants to start your chapters? I, I, I'm terribly sorry, the, the, the voice uh, quality, I couldn't hear all of your question very well. I um, just, just one, the, the, you have used voiced bilabial B to start all your chapters in the 40 rules of love. Whereas uh, by doing that, you have limited yourself by not using other alphabets like L or other voiceless uh, sounds. Okay. okay. <laughs> so otherwise, I like the novel very much. The killing of the silk for silk worm, and uh, also I feel that uh, for me there is some influence of Swami Vivekananda. I don't know whether he has influenced you or Mr. Swami Vivekananda has been influenced by charms of Tabriz as well as you. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you so much. Um, I would love to talk about four heroes of love, but I always feel hesitant um, when people ask me uh, more layered questions about, um, you know, why I did I, I wrote it in a certain way because sometimes it's it's such an irrational thing, you know, when you are in the middle of a story, um, you just I love to follow the flow of the story, and if I may share this with you. I, as you can imagine, I have a lot of respect for both Rumi and Shams of Tabriz. So it's a labor of love, that book. But at the same time, as a writer, I do not believe in heroes. I do not believe in putting anyone on a pedestal. I want to treat everyone as human beings, and human beings are complex with our mistakes, with our flaws. So I want to have a multi-layered storytelling that uh, looks at love from different angles. Sometimes readers thought that those 40 rules were uh, written by Shams of Tabriz. I, I made them up when I was writing the novel. But of course, as a writer, when, when you invent these rules, you also have to respect the, the source, the, the Sufi, the mystical teachings that I, that I researched a lot. So um, I tried to base those rules on the things that I had read. I, I'm interested in those silenced voices. I'm interested in those unheard voices. Uh, and I'm interested in that in the mystical uh, aspect. But I'm not someone um, who tries to, I, I'm not sure I heard the question very well. So I'm just talking about um, how I approach the book. You, you warn me if I am missing anything. Um, but basically, I think I'm, I'm someone who, as I said, I, I see life as a constant learning a journey so rather than saying sometimes when people say think that the 40 rules of love is you know answers lots of questions I feel honored but it is my way of storytelling someone else's interpretation will be completely different and I'm very open to all of that as well all I can say is, is it's um, to me it's a very much a labor of love that looked like uh, because it felt very close to my heart when I was writing it Thank you, Elif, and unfortunately we've run out of time for, for today. Um, 
we would like to thank you very much and hope that very soon you'll be able to join us here in person and uh, that we can all meet you and have book signings and, and have you with us in Dubai. Um, an amazing, an amazing. I'm sorry, I know there's lots of questions, but we have to sanitize the room for the next. Okay, one last question. One last question. <laughs> My name is Elisa and I'm also from Pakistan and I'm 17 years old and currently at school I'm actually writing an essay comparing the Islam, the Sufi Islam in 40 Rules of Love to that of the real life Ottoman Empire. But um, I wanted to ask because I'm also an aspiring author, you talked about how you love observing the poetry of life and how these observations kind of manifest in your work. But beyond a more instinctual or effortless kind of creativity, do you have any specific systems you use to help you fuel your writing? Something that perhaps new writers can try to implement in their own writing process? A beautiful question. I think I agree as writers we need to be two things all our lives, not just at the beginning, but all throughout our lives. We need to be very good readers. Uh, I believe in the importance of reading, as I said, in an interdisciplinary way, in an eclectic way. So not only to read fiction, but read fiction and non-fiction. Not only from the East, but East and West. Or just ha having very diverse reading lists is something that I have benefited from in the sense that I've learned a lot from. And I believe in the importance of being good readers. But secondly, being good listeners. I think as writers, we need to listen to what people are saying all the time. I try to listen to two things, what people are saying, but also with what kind of energy, what kind of emotions they are saying what they're saying. So we need to constantly listen to what the world is saying to us and be open to learning. What I do in my writing process, whatever the subject that I feel I am going to write on, I try to read everything I can find on that subject. Um, I need to know what I'm talking about, it, especially if it's a historical book. I have to do a lot of research. But then there comes the moment when you stop reading, and after that, you can fly. You know, after that, you can start imagining. And from that moment onwards, um, it's, just, it's just you follow your instinct. I think there are two ways of writing a, a novel. One is a bit like engineering in which the novelist wants to be in charge of the book. Uh, and there are wonderful books that have been written with that, on that, with that approach. Um, but in that regard, the, the, no, the novelist wants to know how the novel is going to end, you know, what each and every character is going to do. A second way is more like you don't quite know what you're doing. You follow your intuition, but you have a strong intuition. Uh, and you have to honor that intuition with knowledge. I think my path is the second path. Sometimes. I don't know what the characters are going to do in the next chapter. Sometimes I don't know how the story is going to end. I like it when my characters surprise me, but I follow that strong intuition. So constantly reading, writing, learning, and listening uh, is something that I have learned a lot from. Thank you so much, Elif. It's been an absolute honor. And we look forward to welcoming you in person. Uh, I'd like to thank our title sponsor, Emirates Airline, our founder.